This year's guest, Carol Marine, has spent a lifetime covering politics for television and newspapers. She's won two Peabody Awards, two Emmy Awards for her work. She contributes to work for NBC5 in Chicago and to WTTW's Chicago Tonight. She's also a former Chicago Sun-Times columnist who is now co-director, founding co-director of the new Center for Journalism Integrity and Excellence at DePaul. So please join me in welcoming Carol to SIU for her talk, Confessions of a Die-Hard Political Reporter in an Apocalyptic Year. Carol? Thank you very much. You know, the title is kind of like one of these television teases. You won't believe what happened on the South Side tonight. So apocalyptic seemed like a, a good term, but it actually seems like a technical term for, for this election. Can I just say uh, to the Illinois Campaign for Political Reform, which is coming next week, they are great people, and they do great things. Cindy Canary was the first executive director They've, they've just done marvelous work, you know, in the vineyard of truth, and, and they're very enthusiastic, so <clears throat> I highly recommend them. It's, um, it's sort of expected that a speaker says, it's an honor to be invited to speak tonight, but it is an honor to be invited to speak tonight by David Yepsen, storied political reporter of the Des Moines Register whose insights into the machinations of the Iowa caucuses were essential to every political reporter from coast to coast who yearned to try to understand this mysterious arcane process that launches each presidential season. I still don't understand them. I'm just here to tell you now. I know all this because in 1988, a bow-tied senator from the great state of Illinois set his bespeckled eyes on the prize and went to the hog farms and the hamlets of that state to the west of us. And over the years, David was our expert guide, not just on Iowa, but nationally. And so it was only right, I think, that when Carbondale came calling, he accepted the position as the director of the Public Policy Institute founded by someone we both hold in such high esteem, Paul Simon. Contrary to the conventional wisdom on cable and by many who seek office by claiming not to be political, I'm talking about you, Barack Obama and Bruce Rauner, because that's how each started their quite serious campaigns. My confession number one is that I just don't buy this business that career politician is necessarily a dirty word, any more than career doctor is or career reporter. Yes, we have lousy government officials. God knows you want them. We have them. We have bad doctors. We have terrible reporters. But making a career out of something you know, also suggests that you might believe in it that you might, with time and experience, get good at it. And who knows, you might actually make a difference. Paul and his wife, Jean, chose those kinds of careers. They proved that politics can be an honorable profession, not just as a means to a paycheck and to a government pension. I covered Paul's first race for the US Senate in 1984. I was one of the few girls on the bus back when there were mostly boys. Lynn Sweet was another of the girls. Uh, Mitch Lowson from the Chicago Tribune among the boys. And David Axelrod, of course, who would left the Chicago Tribune to help run Paul's campaign. It was a learning experience for us all, and, and frankly, that includes Paul. Then just four years later came the presidential election of 88. Paul was big ears, bow tie, horn-rimmed glasses, he was a long shot, he was an anomaly, he was an oddity. But in Iowa early on, he was judged a real comer due in large part by the fact that he had Midwestern values and he was the neighbor next door. He and we trudged through the deep 
snow is of Iowa, and it some days was brutal. One day at an outdoor Simon event, I mistakenly wore brand new, fabulous, really high heels. And I am not kidding you when I say I came very close to losing my feet to frostbite. That is confession number two. David's Des Moines Register endorsed Paul, but it was Richard Gephardt of Missouri who won and then who lost the nomination to Massachusetts Governor Michael Dukakis, who then lost in the general election to Ronald Reagan. Nobody runs for president thinking they will fail. And you better have hubris. You better have hubris or you won't survive. Each of those candidates, whether they admit it or not, late at night, see themselves powering across the finish line like Seabiscuit or American Pharaoh. But a presidential campaign is the ultimate come to Jesus trial by fire. And I think in all honesty, confession number three, that the 88 presidential campaign temporarily strained my relationship with Paul Simon, who was followed everywhere by a pack of local and national reporters, of which I was one. One day, with my cameraman sort of walking backwards, shooting both of us in a two-shot, I was peppering him with questions, and he said, a little bit irritated, something to the effect, do the whole pack of you use this gimmick? You know, this was the days before MSNBC and Fox. CNN was still the chicken noodle network. There was no constant campaign coverage on the cables. Reporters still had time to craft their stories for the evening newscasts instead of instantaneously tweeting out the latest meaningless tidbit. In Paul's day, it was punishing. Olympic athletes would struggle with the schedule and the stress of a presidential campaign. And now today, witness yesterday, as Hillary Clinton was overcome by heat and pneumonia. But it's a prime example of how high the stakes are in these races. I'd argue that it has become her pneumonia and her, her sort of falling it became a bigger story because of the way her campaign handled it. Shutting out reporters, even the national press pool that travels with her. That miscalculation, I think, only amped up the interest in what otherwise would have been a more mundane case of a lung infection. It's all anyone is talking about today, probably even now on the late, later night cables. And so, and it overcomes Trump's refusal to release his taxes. Therefore, by not releasing his taxes, shutting out a closer examination of his business in, of, or investments, it shuts out the fact that he won't even allow a traveling press pool. I, I would give anything. This is true every election for me. I'd give anything if my parents were alive to see this race because Confession number four, I'm a child of a divided household. And so I was born to be a political reporter. I blame Bernice and Knut Marine for this. My mother was a devout Catholic and she was a Roosevelt Democrat. My father was a fallen away Baptist, an Eisenhower man who went on to manage campaigns for independent Republicans. Dinner every night of my childhood was a food fight. <laughs> Our little house in Rolling Meadows in the northwest suburbs of Chicago was a fierce debating society that unbeknownst to me at the time was toughening me up for the work I'm doing now. My parents lived for election day when they could go to the polls together and cancel each other out. <laughs> Long before the Bush-Gore race declared us a 50-50 country, I lived in a 50-50 tract house. My Aunt Florence and her 
my Uncle Vern were Democratic precinct captains. I mean, it was everywhere. In the presidential contest of 1960, my mother voted for John Kennedy, my dad voted for Richard Nixon, and again in 1968, and then felt betrayed by Nixon in Watergate. In the Illinois gubernatorial contest of the same year, 1960, my father voted for William Stratton, my mother voted for Otto Kerner, who won, and then she was betrayed years later when Kerner went to federal prison for taking a bribe of racetrack stock. I won a National Journalism Award years ago for reporting on corruption and election shenanigans, specifically how then Chicago Congressman Bill Lipinski's precinct captains were falsifying nominating petitions and running ringer candidates, you know, time-honored tradition so that Lipinski would win by a landslide. But it was my parents who first taught me the old phony petition game. The Democrats tried against one of the candidates my dad was running to do that, and though my mother was a Democrat, she did not abide corruption. They spotted on these petitions remarkably similar signatures, like hundreds and hundreds of people with identical penmanship, but different names. And so they report it to the authorities, and a state official knocks on the door, shows my mother his badge, and said, I've come to take the petitions. But my mother, she smelled a rat. She said, could I look a little more closely at that badge? The guy took off. So we knew he wasn't for real. We were so thrilled as kids because my parents slept with the petitions between their mattresses, so no one <laughs> would get them until they could report it to the real authorities who ultimately didn't do much either. <laughs> you know and I know that we have a long-standing, terrible, well-deserved reputation in Illinois for corruption. And if it's changed at all, it just hasn't changed enough. But back to what brought me here. What would Paul Simon think of the current race for the White House? I'd love to hear that, too. Clearly, he'd be championing the election of the first woman president. I don't think there's any question about that. But, and clearly, he would be aghast at the rhetoric of this race and would not tolerate what Donald Trump has been saying. But he'd be troubled by Hillary Clinton, too, by her emails, by some of the things that have happened in her campaign. He was a consensus builder who joined with Republicans in trying to balance the federal budget. He would be appalled at the polarization that plagues both the nation and his home state. And I think he would spend many sleepless nights, more of them than he probably did back then, agonizing over the endless search for more and more millions to fund campaigns especially given the huge discomfort he felt in asking people he didn't particularly like for money. Paul Simon would not fit into this electorate. It's an electorate, you know, that would more likely agree with economist John Kenneth Galbraith's assessment when Galbraith said, politics is the art of choosing between the disastrous and the unpalatable. And I'm running into this everywhere I go. I'm in the primary season. I'm in Treasure Island, which is a grocery store on the north side of Chicago in Lincoln Park. I'm staring down the canned food aisle, and a well-dressed, middle-aged, well-spoken, well-educated man comes up, and he says, I'm really sorry to interrupt you, but I, I just have to ask. You know, what should he do, he said. He's inclined to go with Hillary Clinton. He's really liked her, wants a woman president. But Trump, is really appealing to him. And I'm standing there by the tuna fish. <laughs> and, and I'm thinking, Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump, Donald Trump, Hillary Clinton, could there be two candidates more unalike? You know, what's, what's happening here in this country? In Montana just last month, a cowboy who almost always votes Republican asked me the same question. And normally, 
you know, he'd be a GOP guy, but he doesn't like Trump, and he cannot trust Hillary Clinton, he tells me. And then last week, I talked to a retired Alabama state insurance executive, a woman, who says to me, he's a bully who won't compromise with other countries, and her policies on health care I just don't like. Voters and pundits for a large part of this campaign have chosen almost apocalyptic or outright apocalyptic terms to describe what's going to happen to this country if one or the other of these candidates is elected. This is the kind of election we have never seen. I know it's the kind of election I have never seen. And I've, I've covered a lot of them. But the extreme language being used and the dire warnings being issued about what will happen are beyond, I think, anything of our normal political experience. And you know, it's not like uh, we haven't heard extreme terms in politics. God knows, going back to, you know, when they were carving campaigns on stone tablets, I suppose. But, and I think of Harold Washington. I covered that mayor's race in 1983. And that, there was an apocalypse there predicted. His Republican white opponent, Bernard Epton, in the general election, had a none too subtle end of the word, world slogan that was loaded with racial innuendo and laced with Armageddon. It was Epton before it's too late. Well, Harold, you know, the city stood. It, it, you know, the, the civilization as we knew it in the city of Chicago uh, did not change so radically. I can give you lots of other examples of, of the rhetoric, but you know them. You listen to the news. You, you know this story. Last week, the New York Times online Paul Krugman asked the question, will innuendo in the presidential race bring on an apocalypse? Uh, he didn't, I think, answer it to his or anyone else's satisfaction, but the two candidates have not helped us out on this or toned it down or, or trimmed the sails of the apocalyptic language. You know, Trump labeling Clinton all kinds of things, including a bigot calling Mexican drug dealers racists and rape, I mean rapists and drug dealers. Clinton, this latest thing, declaring Trump followers, half of them anyway, a basket of deplorables. You know, how do either one of them expect to unite this country after the election? Is it any worse, I ask myself, than Mitt Romney's writing off the so-called 47 percenters? Or Barack Obama dismissing John McCain supporters as clinging to their guns and their religion? Yeah, I think it's different. I think it's more vitriolic, more slanderous, and more destructive. And, and you know, here in Illinois, in our own political debate, we haven't necessarily raised the bar very much either. But here in Illinois, you can almost believe there is an apocalypse coming. I mean, we're just about at the end of a six-month spending plan that was a patchwork compromise for an annual budget. We're a year and a half behind in paying medical providers. Former Governor Jim Edgar told me not too long ago that he and Brenda now pay their doctors in cash and wait for reimbursement later because even though they're on the state insurance system, their doctors aren't going to get going to get paid. And I know that here in southern Illinois, where your enrollment has dropped 7.6 percent, there's profound concern among faculty and students and community about what's being lost in education as a result and in the economy of this region amid all of these battles in the state capitol between the governor and the speaker. And so the lesson we learn again and again to our peril is we don't get a solution until we're done with the next election. And so nothing, this isn't a confession, this is just obvious, nothing will get done until after the November election 
and nothing will probably get done until after January. And even then, will it be enough and will it be meaningful? I, I'm just not betting on it. Will the, will the legislature look different? Let's think about that. Ken Duncan, a Chicago Democrat who, who voted on the Republican side with Governor Rauner is gone, and he is likely replacement, will vote Democrat. Jack Franks, a Republican of McHenry, who regularly voted for, with Governor Rauner, is gone, and he probably will be replaced by a Republican. Roger McAuliffe versus Mary Marwig on the northwest side of Chicago, that's a proxy war between Rauner and Madigan. Madigan with a ground game, Rauner with $16 million. Sheila Simon versus Mike Schimpf for the Senate down here in the 58th District. Another one of those battles. On the national side of things, Senator Mark Kirk slugs it out with Tammy Duckworth, both with compelling personal stories, neither generating very much excitement. Duckworth has five million, Kirk has three million. But when it comes to individual contributions, from inside the state, not those outside PACs and not those outside donors, not Barbara Streisand, not, you know, the Cook brothers, not anybody like that. From inside the state, she has 4,900 individual donations and he has 4,400 individual donations separated only by about $15,000. Those are votes. Those are votes. And so Mark Kirk can take some hope in that. I don't know how much but this is the number one U.S. Senate race out of nine that could change the balance in the U.S. Senate. For Congress up north, it's a rematch of Dold and Schneider, and boy, that's a coin toss. Mike Bost, you know, in the 12th, has two candidates, pardon me? Did I, is it Bost or Bost? Bost? Bost, forgive me. Mike Bost, two candidates, heating up. And here's confession number five, and I'm, I think it's a conclusion you may have come to, too. I don't think voters care enough. I, I was surprised when I crunched this number and looked at it. We have a 63% turnout rate for the past four presidential elections, including two elections where an adopted favorite son of Illinois was at the top of the ticket. We are 31st out of 50 states in voting in presidential elections behind Montana, North Dakota, and Alaska. You can't tell me that Chicago's snow is worse in preventing people turning out than up in those places. I attribute this indifference to indifference and disinterest in large part because there isn't trust. Not trust in elected officials, and there's not trust in people like me. I live in and love the city of Chicago, but covering government every day up there is a battle to get information on a timely basis, to have our Freedom of Information Act requests answered. And it's nearly impossible to get a straight answer out of Mayor Rahm Emanuel. There is a trust deficit so large that the citizenry, many of them, don't believe anything that comes out of City Hall or the police department or the Chicago public school system. The violence crisis in Chicago shows no signs of abating, and whether you believe there should not be much sympathy for the city, crises there hurt the entire state because Chicago is the economic engine of this state. I live in and love the state of Illinois, too. I was born here. But whether it was Blagojevich, Quinn, or now Rauner, the state department heads are fearful of talking to us. Lawmakers are afraid of crossing the governor or the speaker. So what you get most of the time are carefully crafted, meaningless sound bites that tell us and the citizens that we report to not very much. Then again, no one trusts the media anyway to deliver the message. I drove into Cleveland for the Republican convention, and as I drove in, there's a huge billboard that says, don't believe the liberal media. Then again, Rush Limbaugh, recently on the radio, said, don't believe the conservative media if they're listening to conservative intellectuals. Listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> Even fact-checking 
websites with no ax to grind are rejected in an era of social media because you can always find verification somewhere of what you believe, whether it's true or not. I would love tonight to be your ray of sunshine on this marvelous fall evening in Southern Illinois, but, but I just can't. I believe we're at a point of reckoning in a civil society that's lost its civility. Politics is messy. Democracy is born of compromises. We need them. It's OK. It's making sausage, but it's making important sausage. These are our tools. They've served us well or well enough. But anymore, there aren't compromises. And there isn't a conviction in favor of what we used to call democracy. Whoever wins the presidency, his or her task will be to heal the deep wounds of this election. And it won't be easy, and it might not, I fear, be possible. So I close with the words of Paul Simon. Not our Paul Simon, but Paul Simon, the poet and the songwriter. We come on the ship they call Mayflower. We come on the ship that sailed the moon. We come in the age's most uncertain hour and sing an American tune. Except it's a tune that's more discordant than it's ever been in our lifetime. I thank you so much for having me. We now enter the question and answer portion of the lecture. Uh, we have a couple of microphones uh, that will uh, will get to you when when you have a a question. Who's got Who's got them back there? Lucas, Kimberly, okay. Um, and we ask that you use it. Uh, we're trying to make a recording of this. There are people who have difficulty hearing some things. Carol, I want to start off with, um, and you alluded to this. Do you think in this climate today, Paul Simon could win an election in Illinois? Um, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I really don't. I think um, there's not much room for moderates, for middle of the road, for people who want to work across the aisle. And so I think he'd be portrayed as potentially weak um, lacking conviction, I think it would be a, a great test. And I think he probably couldn't raise the kind of money and, and wouldn't want to have to do what he'd have to do to raise right. it. Right, which is part of the reason he left the Senate. Hmm? Part of the reason he left the Senate yes. was, the, was, was money. Um, second question, and then we'll throw it open. Um, and Willie has a question. What are the process, what do we have, what has to change? There's an excellent analysis of the problems that we face, but think prescriptively, uh, if you will, about the kinds of things we have to make to our laws and our process to, to right this ship. Is it the fault of caucuses and primaries dominated by interest groups? Is it the fault of money and politics? What's your, what, what's the key to fixing this thing? I think redistricting is a real problem. I mean, I think you've got voters have got to pick their politicians and, and not politicians pick their voters. That's a real hard fight to fight. And as we know, not just in Illinois, but whichever party is in control in whichever state, it's, it's a bear. I, if there can be a national way to approach it, I think that really has to happen. But it's got to come from people like us and people, you know, voters. There's got to be a groundswell to make anyone listen. I think, I think there's a reckoning point for media. I think after this is over, you know, after the first Iraq war, there was a real question of whether we did our job and did it right. And I think things changed because it was the days of the embed and that sort of thing. And all of a sudden, you know, we had to look at ourselves and say, did we do that right or did we do that wrong? Grenada was another example. Um, so there's, there's a media reckoning, and, 
And I think politicians have got to be scared to death. I saw a Ralph Nader quote. He said uh, that he said to his father, I really think there needs to be a third political party. And his father said, I'd be happy with just a second. Um, you know, right now the Republicans have got to be asking themselves, how decimated are they by this process? And, and now there are plenty of Democrats having jitters over what's happened with Clinton. So I think the political parties, I, I don't, I'm sorry to be so vague about it, but I just, we all have a, a, have a, a sheet of, in the songbook, and we got to start singing it. All right, let's, let's throw this open to questions. Willie, and then down here. Thank you again for coming. Uh, my question uh, follows up on uh, Mr. Yebsen's comment or question about uh, what do we do to fix the problem, and I think your prescription uh, with the media being a part of that problem and needing to do reevaluation. Uh, as it relates to uh, Secretary Clinton's, uh, what some would call an, an artful uh, slip of the tongue when she called half of Donald Trump's uh, supporters deplorable, uh, how does the media handle reporting on that? So uh, right now the reporting is, you know, well, you know she made an inartful statement and she shouldn't have said it, but how do you handle the fact that there is a lot of truth uh, in what she said when there is polling data that suggests that uh, a supermajority of uh, Donald Trump supporters thinks that our current president wasn't born in the United States, support a Muslim ban, uh, things that we would associate with people who um, would be deplorable. Let me start at the beginning of your question because, and this is something I, I say to every one of my students, there is no such thing as the media. Is it the National Review or is it Mother Jones? Is it CNN or is it Fox? I mean, there are people who are pulling apart this story to look at it at carefully, but all of us aren't watching all of it. And so there's, there's a problem. I, I worry a little bit about generalizations. The Donald Trump's supporters I mean, was it a slip of the tongue for Hillary Clinton? I don't know if it was or it wasn't. Was it a plan and then they saw it was bad? Was Mitt Romney a, sl a slip of the tongue about 47 percenters because he thought he was in a safe zone and wasn't, wasn't being heard? I, I don't know. But each of them apologized. So let's start there. They both decided they made a mistake. Now, what's the mistake? Are there, is there racism and misogyny and all of those things in this country? Yes, absolutely. And they're worthy discussions. But, but there's no, what am I struggling for here? There's no sort of simple way to say, yes, Clinton made a mistake, but those Trump people really all are. You know, because they all aren't. Certainly some of them are. Maybe most of them are, but, but it's that generalization that doesn't get us to any dance, if you know, if you know what I mean. Um, I think Clinton could have said, I am opposed to the statements that are racist. I am opposed to, to, to Donald Trump making what I believe are bigoted remarks. But it's just hard to label half of his supporters as something, and then go govern. And that's where I think the, 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 the problem is. Uh, it's in, it, it, was, it, was a heavy, it was a heavy hand, and it was a damaging hand. But I'd like to ask about the media. Um, and do you, do you feel that the media has um, fairly addressed Trump's reticence to be forthcoming, like his taxes, his health? I mean, I think that they haven't. I think some of what's happened, and and I'm trying to break this out between because I think some of it happens more often in the cable world, not to unfairly label it, but I think there's more, there's more air to fill and uh, than say on the nightly news or in, I mean, it's, it's a less sort of regulated space in a way. And 
and I think he becomes a bit of a reality show. He's entertaining, and the reason that there have been high ratings, high ratings for the debates, is the entertainment factor of this. And the entertainment factor sure wasn't Jeb Bush, you know, and, and you know it, it wasn't any of those guys up there. It was Donald Trump, and so there was a kind of of excitement, I think, among television executives that this is, this is a ratings go-getter. But I think in some of those debates, um, media, Fox, um, NBC, uh, in, those, in those primary debates, did a really good job of trying to, to drill it out. The problem was, you could argue this, Trump supporters said, you're always yelling at him, you're always going to him, you're not spending time with the others. And yet the other problem was, you're trying to grab him like mercury, and he's slipping through your fingers, and so you go back to it. It's not a, an easily solved problem, but, um, but I think there really has been some good reporting on this. And some bad, and some bad, and some bad. My, my second question is, if, if Trump should lose, um, do you think, uh, how do you think the Republican Party will reform? I mean, is there a possibility that they might reemerge as a more moderate party? I don't know about that, but here's the other thing. I think Trump becomes the new Fox News. I mean, what, what I really think is happening here, and I'm not alone in this, is there is a new media platform in development here with Roger Ailes there, the Brightheart people there. Um, there, is, there is a new um, kind of a Rush limbo on TV sort of, of thing evolving, I believe. So that's one force that the Republicans are going to have to, to reckon with. And then, you know, the other thing is there are moderate Republicans. There are conservative Republicans who, who are not going to support Trump because they in conscience, in their conscience, feel they can't. There are some Democrats who aren't going to support Hillary Clinton for the same reason. Maybe not as many and not maybe as vocal um, publicly. I think both parties are in distress. Um, and, I, and I do think, yes, that they're going to have to figure out rhetorically in other ways how they're going to get to get trust back. Got two questions on this side, her and then uh, Gil to get to the second question. Last week, uh, Matt Maurer was uh, universally trounced for his performance with the foreign policy forums. Um, during the debates that are coming up in two weeks, is it Lester Holt's job to fact check during the debate, or does that come later with analysis? No, I think it's it's everybody's job to to the degree that they can fact check during the debate. You know, Candy Crowley got eaten up for that, and I think improperly so in, in one of the previous debates. Um, and I, I was watching, um, who's the NBC correspondent who was doing MS um, today? I, I've just lost her name in my head. But she was challenging both Clinton's people and Trump's people when they would say, like one of Clinton's people said, Donald Trump has got you know, all these investments in China and that's what we know and that's what he's hiding. And she said, that has not been established. There is no evidence for that. I mean, she was stopping them regularly and then Trump's people, the same thing, uh, making assertions about Clinton. And, and it was a hard, you know, it was a hard job because it, it's a hard TV to watch because you're interrupting, you're speaking over. But, but she, was, um, she was doing a fine piece of work on it. And it's, it's all of their jobs. They picked moderators this time with, um, with Lester uh, and, pardon me, with Lester Holt and with uh, Chris Wallace and I believe um, Anderson Cooper and, um, boy, my brain is not working. The vice presidential, the vice presidential is, um, is a CBS correspondent who does the weekend news. Pardon me? No, no, it's, it's a woman. It's a woman, but they're all good. They're all good, they're serious, they're not. Oh, Martha Raddus is doing one of them, yes. But the, but, uh, the vice presidential is being done by uh, Elaine Quijano. 
Uh, and, and they're all very serious, good journalists. They're not flamethrowers. They're not ideological. They're not showboats, in my experience. But that's a hard job. And going to Matt Lauer, and, and should he have known what he didn't know? Yes. He, frankly, he would tell you that, too. I've, I've moderated a lot of debates, and I got to tell you, on live television, there but for the grace of God, you know, <laughs> go I. Because, because, you know, you really can. You're, you're working hard, you're trying to listen, you're, you're taking cues, you're trying to do it well. And, and I have screwed up on live TV more times than I can count and gone home and wanted to kill myself for about a month. So I, ha I have a little bit of, of sympathy too. What's your opinion on uh, the length of the shirt tails of Clinton and, and uh, Trump? You think voters will separate congressional and legislative voting from the presidential, or you think that one or the other has the potential of uh, pulling vote or winners into their party, into the congressional party as well. Who has the longest shirt tails, I guess, is my question. I don't think either one of them have that long a shirt tail. And what I worry about as much is that nobody votes for either one of them, and then they don't mess with the bottom of the ballot. Or if, or, or, or if they do, I mean, it's, I think it can be a, a confusion of, of possibilities, just like the Illinois numbers. You would think that we, this politically engaged and corruption-drenched state would be so mad and so eager and so interested that we'd be out there. And we're not. Um, so I don't know, but I'm not convinced that there are big shirt tails. Other questions? I think back there. Okay. I think. We cut off your second question. I'm sorry, we're coming back. We will. We're kind of mired in this uh, dominant position that there's only two parties. It's, uh, Could you talk a little? I'm having a little trouble hearing you. Well, all right. We're, we seem to be mired in this dominant position that there's only two parties, and there's at least 60. I'm thinking with two such repulsive candidates, don't you think maybe America might be primed for a third candidate, a third party candidate? Yeah, except it doesn't. I mean, ask Ralph Nader, who, you know, um, and, and with a third party candidate, again, this gets back to the fact that this is an Olympic test, you better know what Aleppo is. You know, and, and so there are, I'm there with you that there needs to be better choices. And, and for a time, for instance, in Illinois, the Green Party seemed to be passing the threshold of, of the 5% so they could actually get in the debates and so forth. But that withered and died. So <clears throat> somewhere along the line, voters have, those parties, first of all, have got to have figure something out, but voters have to be interested, and they're not. Willie. Willie, I'm sorry, I cut you off on your second question. No worries, thank you for recognizing me again. Um, I guess part two of the... Part one. <laughs> part one, yeah, another question. Um, does the media do a disservice to the American people when they uh, give this narrative that uh, both parties are in disarray or a pox on both their houses, when there is uh, Mr. Uh, Norm Warren, uh, Warsby, I think is his name, has done some really good reporting on uh, how there has been one particular party uh, that has contributed significantly uh, to uh, the dysfunction that we see in our politics today. But when it's reported, um, Granted, I'm speaking generally, when it's reported in the media, uh, there's this narrative uh, as if uh, both of our major political parties uh, seem to be contributing to our dysfunction when there's real evidence to suggest that uh, that's not the case. 
evidence in, in what you're talking about, I think, is subjective. And you talk to plenty of Republicans who would argue that the Democrats have not been willing for all those years to play fair, that it's, a, it's their time of reckoning, can argue that the White House has not done the outreach that it needed to. I mean, I think that's, that ends up being, in a and depending upon the part of the country you're in, and depending upon what your political persuasion is, that ends up being um, a, a subjective value unless you can find a way to, to quantify it data-wise. And, and I know there are people who've tried, except you know, data is problematic, uh, problematic too. I, I think part of it is just that, that blame process. I know when, when Obama came in, and Mitch McConnell said, you know, our goal is to get him out in four years. That wasn't exactly collegial. Um, but, but I think that the problem is deeper and graver than that, and, and I blame them both. I, and I may be wrong, too, and that may be my subjectivity. I'd be interested in what David thinks of that. I guess we know who's boss here. <laughs> well, the media deserves some of the blame for creating the divide. I watch different stations all the time, and, and it seems to me like uh, the media keeps feeding one side or another at different times just for the purpose of maybe getting viewership and selling advertisements and things of that nature. It seems to me like they sensationalize a lot of things that maybe are not that important, and just for the sake of, of selling advertisement. I think a lot of people think that, um, and I think there is a case to be made sometimes, but I don't buy it. I mean, you watch, let's just talk about the network news for a second. What do they lead with now most of the time? And maybe this actually does agree with you. They lead with weather. They lead with weather. Why? Because the argument is that more people are interested in weather than they are interested in politics, or interested in health, or interested in corruption in the, in the country. So, you know, the, are they interested in getting ratings? Yes. Are they trying to pick subjects that they think people are interested in? Of course, I've never been told by one of my bosses, sex up this political story because you know, we need, you're not sensational enough. But I think, you know, in a close look at, at, at a lot of the reporting that I see, I think there's some stupid reporting. I, I can point that out on a pretty regular basis. Um, or some cliche ridden reporting. But, but I've never been told that I need to, to jazz it up because the car dealer down the way needs to get more Ford sold. And, and so there's, it, it doesn't, for me at least, work that way. Right there, and then John in the back. What do you see as the most promising way forward in terms of the budget stalemate and the larger dysfunction in Springfield? Oh. Oh, God. One of my jobs in Chicago is to moderate Chicago tonight's political panels. And once a month, twice a month, sometimes three times a month, I'm interviewing lawmakers. You know, we have some smart lawmakers in Springfield. We really do. But they're not the leaders. And, and so they're not Madigan. They're not Durkin. Uh, and those caucuses run by a really fierce discipline. Madigan has an iron fist and Rauner has an iron fist. And both have pretty substantial wallets. So Madigan's being tested by Rauner on that. Um, until the mushrooms, that's what they call the rank and file, mushrooms. You know, they live in the dark. They're fertilized by fill in the blank. 
and you know they only are seen when it's time to vote. Some have tried to rear their heads and say, I'm not, I'm not gonna do this anymore. But there aren't enough of them. And the reason there aren't enough of them is because the governor and the speaker hold the purse strings to their next election. Is term limits the answer? I'll tell you right now, I think term limits is a sop to, uh, to gather voters, but means absolutely nothing. One, it's unconstitutional. Pat Quinn tried it and so did Bruce Rauner. It's unconstitutional. And secondly, I want an experienced lawmaker, you know, because I want someone with, with some ranking in the committee that gets the bill out. So, but it take, it's going to take the rank and file to, to rise up or voters to throw out somebody they otherwise wouldn't throw out. They didn't throw out Mike Madigan in his district. Um, so, I, I don't know, I've been in Springfield where they filled the rotunda with protesters. Handicapped children, you know, poor mothers and fathers. Did it touch the heartstrings? No, you can't even hear them down in the rotunda because the door's closed and they're soundproofed. Um, so I, I apologize to you for not having an answer, but, uh, but I don't. This will be the last question. I was wondering if you could comment on what you think the future of the two parties nomination process will be. The Democrats use more of the super delegate where it helps ensure the party person beats the upstart and the Republicans don't and they are now faced with the opposite problem. So which party do you think is more likely to change? It's a you know, the, the math of this, and truly I do think David knows the answer to this and I don't. The, the math of it in that super delegate, I mean, it's worse than the Iowa caucuses in the sense of figuring out how you pick delegates, how you pick delegates state by state and who's got supers and who doesn't. Uh, something has to change on that. You can argue something has to change in the electoral college too. That we have an arcane ancient process by which we are not, Al Gore can win the popular vote, but George Bush can, you know, can win the college. Um, but there has to be a will. I think there's a formula. I think there's a way to do it. But, but I wouldn't presume to tell you that I know what that formula is, and it's going to have to be worked out by these people anyway. So do you have a theory on that? Process. On, on delegates, superdelegates. How you, in the nomination of a presidential candidate, is there something in some way to reform it? I don't want to intrude on the I want you to so, intrude on Superdelegates were created because in, 19, in 1972, the Democratic Party reformed itself and was hijacked by the left and went over the cliff with George McGovern. And so the party decided, well, we need some grown-ups here. And that maybe we ought to have some people uh, as delegates who are political practitioners, who are party officials, who are um, who hold public office. Going back to your point about, gee, it wouldn't go to a doctor who advertised he knew nothing about a inside of a hospital. Uh, and so, you know, there's there's been this constant tension inside the party uh, between people who say you ought to listen to the people, and party people who say, wait a minute. We're a party. It's our business to nominate candidates who we think can win. We don't have direct democracy here. And that is just a pendulum that goes back and forth. Uh, and one other thought is some party is going to win 270 electoral votes and some party is not. The party who does not is going to have some real soul searching. And they will be the party that has a, a debate over its process. You know, what, what's wrong with our process? It produced this loser. Uh, and that's where my home state come in, comes in, because people will say, who gave us this turkey? It was Iowa. <laughs> or it was New Hampshire. Uh, and then there will be an argument between those who say, the second argument inside that party will be those who say, our message wasn't liberal enough, or it was too liberal. And this, the, the reverse of that will happen in the Republican Party. We were too conservative, we were not conservative enough. That's the game that unfolds every year. The party that wins 270 electoral votes is going to say, it's a great system. We won. Why are they going to want to tinker with a process that they, uh, that they just 
They just won. All right, we have to do one more question. One more? Yeah, you can't finish with me. We have to do one more question. One more. I think we can. Yes. Did you have one or oh, you're pointing? Okay. He's, we're getting the microphone to you. Raise your hand. I talked to one of the mushrooms a while back. And, yeah. Uh, the unnamed mushroom uh, predicted that nothing will happen, one, until 2018, until they find the final resolution for where the actual political power in the state will lie. And after the next uh, gubernatorial election, essentially. And then, two, we walked through, I think you may have mentioned, I'm, uh, I walk, I've been up in Chicago for 25 years, so I have watched it. Uh, this is my hometown, uh, so I can see what's going on in this state on both sides. And uh, about one and a half million people have left the state. And I'm not sure if that really has sunk into the economic capacity of the government to support what their projects are. And I watch Channel 11, or I read the Tribune, and sometimes I read them all. I used to read Crane, I thought I read those guys. But there's just not enough taxpayers left in the state. Yeah. And I don't think it's sunk in. Instead, they blame all kinds of other reasons. And that's just a comment. But what do you think about the 2018 timeline? I think we, we always do a timeline like that. We're, we have to wait till the next thing, the next election. We, you know, this election won't be good enough. We have to wait for the next one. I think it's, it's baloney. It's, uh, it's deferring. I keep asking lawmakers, when are we actually going to be over the cliff? And they say, we are over the cliff but it's not felt necessarily in Winnetka where they can afford to pay their taxes. It's felt in East St. Louis, or it's felt you know, in places that are poorer and have a, a poorer tax base. Whether the governor or the speaker want to think about it, we have to raise revenue. We have to raise revenue somehow from some new source or change the way we tax, either to raise the income tax or do a, a much more progressive kind of tax. Ralph Martiri of the Center for Tax Accountability has written about this and written about it really thoughtfully. And Lawrence Massal of the Civic Federation, and they don't agree on a lot of things, but they, they've really moved closer together that, you know, they're like the two sane people in the asylum. Um, and, and I urge you to, to take a look at what they've said because they're coming closer and closer together. It's not going to be pretty. We won't like it. We will absolutely hate it, but it's the only thing to save Illinois, I think. I thank you so much. This is such an honor. Thank you, Carol, for making the trek down here. Before we leave, it's our tradition to present our guest speakers with uh, some tokens of our appreciation. Uh, one is Jack Tickner's fine film on Paul's life, the Paul Simon story, A Life of Uncommon Courage. We, it's, a, it's a great film, Jack. And the other is uh, Dr. John Jackson's uh, book on uh, Paul Simon's timeless writings. I always tell the crowd, this is Paul Simon's greatest hits. Oh, <laughs> But it's an anthology of, of some of Paul's works that, that my colleague, Dr. Jackson, has, has prepared. So again, thank you, Carol, thank for being you here. Thank you. thank you.